Today on Art Is, we will take you on a two-part series to the Birmingham Museum of Art. Currently, the museum is the largest municipal museum in the Southeast. Through its collections, exhibitions, and outreach programs, the museum serves as an important educational and cultural resource for the state and region. Museum director Gail Trexel will begin the tour with the museum's legendary Beeson Wedgwood Collection. The museum was given the Wedgwood Collection in 1975. The collection had been amassed by Dwight and Lucille Beeson, neither of whom were Birmingham natives but came to love this city. Dwight was born in Mississippi and Lucille in Tennessee, but he came to Alabama to work with then Liberty National Life Insurance Company and they fell in love with Alabama and with Birmingham and in the 1940s they also fell in love with Wedgwood. Mrs. Beeson had been to the Metropolitan and seen a Wedgwood exhibition and became captivated with his production and pottery making in general and the English potteries in Staffordshire. She began collecting and Dwight became very interested and they both became interested in the pottery but also in Wedgwood's life which really benefited the museum because they amassed a fantastic library that accompanies this collection. The collection is considered the finest of Wedgwood's production in America, on display in America. And the reason for its, its um, reputation of this is because it contains more pieces from the Wedgwood and Bentley era than any other collection in the country. Wedgwood had a partner by the name of Thomas Bentley and they began working together in the 1760s but formed a partnership in 1769. And Bentley was a great student of the classics and was well traveled and had many wonderful contacts, people he introduced Wedgwood to, and brought a lot of the, the enthusiasm for um, say the antique style that was becoming popular in the 1760s and 1770s with the discovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum. He was bringing that sort of information to Wedgwood and was very much, very sophisticated, had a great style and, it, and as I said very scholarly. Wedgwood was I think one of 12 children born into a potting family in Staffordshire but his father had been a fairly mediocre potter and Wedgwood took the basics that he learned growing up and really put it to use um, more than anyone could have imagined. He worked with other potters like Thomas Wheeldon who was very famous, learned from him, but then he really went off. He was a great chemist himself, he developed glazes, he developed new pottery bodies, um, he improved the creamware. Creamware was a, a, a ware that was being produced in great quantities in the mid-18th century in Staffordshire, but he wanted to make it even purer and even cleaner and was inspired a lot by the porcelain production that was coming to the, to the forefront at that time and purified the clays and was also a great entrepreneur and marketer. And he gave to Queen Charlotte, then Queen of England, a tea set and asked her if he could rename his creamware Queensware and began calling himself Potter to the Queen as well. So always he had in mind of how can I promote this ware and how can I promote my business, which um, stood him in good stead all of his life. And of course, as you know, Wedgwood is still being produced today and tremendous um, quality all, always um, held before the factory. But he, he improved the creamware, then he went on and worked with a black body, a black ware that he renamed Basalt. And this was to look a lot like some of the bronzes that people were collecting and putting in library niches. And you'll see many find busts made of basalt in our collection. But you'll also see a lot of vases and tea wares. And um, the black also was to show up the whiteness of ladies' hands as they poured tea. And basalt is probably my personal favorite of all the things that Wedgwood made because I think it is so elegant. And Wedgwood himself said, the black is sterling and it will last forever. And you look at a lot of the contemporary design museums and a lot of what they often collect is the basalt. And he also was able to take the basalt ware and copy uh, the, the wares, the pottery, the red figured pottery, the Greek pottery that was being discovered and make it look ancient. He was able to just paint the red designs on that and make it appear to be an ancient pottery ware. And he, he used his basalt for that as, as a canvas so for those wonderful um, depictions as well. Then he is most famous for jasper ware. And of course when people walk in our gallery they think, they say, oh, Wedgwood isn't just blue and white. And that is what we think of, the jasper ware that he developed in the 1770s, which is a very hard-bodied ware, almost a porcelain, 
and it's, it was a, a clay body that had the ability to be dyed a variety of colors, the blue that we associate with him, but a variety of blues, a deep blue, a light blue, but also lilac and green and more rarely yellow. Um, yellow is a hard color to fire in pottery, it often turns. And so he, we don't see as much yellow. In fact, Mrs. Beeson is pictured in her portrait with her favorite piece in the collection, which is a tricolor yellow vase, a yellow vase that has blue and white bas relief on it. And also can be colored black, and um, you'll see black examples as well. And it was actually these jasperware pieces that first captivated Mrs. Beeson because she was so interested in the bas relief. And the bas relief is the decoration that is added to the, to the surface. These pieces are made in separate molds and then when they get to a what's called cheese hard or leather hard stage, they're pulled from the mold, moistened and applied to the teapot or the vase, the original body, and then fired. And the, the relief of these pieces can be just tremendous. Um, the workers in Wedgwood's factories, after, before they were fired, they would do something called undercutting. They would go and they would they would take away a lot of the clay and they would make it even more sculptural and even more delicate. And Lucille's first piece that she saw was she said just like a confection with this wonderful bas relief coming off the teapot. And so the Jasper Ware really made him very famous and it was very, very popular. We and continues in popularity today. Um, some of the pieces that we are most known for, I would say in particular, we have two copies of the Portland vase. And the Portland vase was what Wedgwood was probably the most proud of. And he was able to copy an antique Roman glass vase, and a cameo glass vase. And he had that on loan and from the family, and really had time to study it and to try to emulate in Jasper what had been made in glass. And as I said, he was such a student of the antique to have this and to really try to, to copy and to give respect to this this ancient piece I think gave him a great deal of pleasure and we have a blue black copy and we have a black copy and this this dark dark blue copy that was actually um, had belonged at one time to a member of the Darwin family is a very rare copy and I think he considered it his finest that came closest to the original glass vase in, in appearance and we have as I said two, two copies of that in our collection we also have some pieces from the service that he made for Catherine the Great of Russia and in the mid-1700s, Catherine the Great came to Wedgwood and said that she wanted a service for her palace in Leningrad, which sounds fine, except she wanted the service to consist of, as I, if I remember correctly, 925 pieces, each painted with a different scene of English countryside. Wedgwood had to hire artists. He didn't have, there weren't enough scenes to just give his artists a copy on the, on the creamware service. Um, he had to hire more people in-house to do the work, and he had tremendous concern. Here was a member of royalty who wanted the service. Royalty were famous for not paying their bills. He was having to spend a lot of money up front to commission artists to do the work, to produce the wear. Um, a huge job. But he did it. He, before it went, he put it in his London showroom. Um, people were just stacked up outside to come and see this incredible service before it left for Russia. He did get paid. Now whether he actually made money or not, I'm not sure. He probably did lose money on the deal short term, but long term it was such a great PR event that I'm sure he made, he made more money through other commissions. Um, but we also have pieces from that service which are, are, are extremely rare to have as well. Join us next week as we continue to explore the world of the arts.